Body and soul, I am marvelously made. You knit me in my mother's womb. Teach me wisdom in my secret heart. I have sinned through my actions. Cleanse me of my immoral behavior. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy, gladness. Let the bones that you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain in me a willing spirit. With my, my whole heart, 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 I seek you. Do not let me stray. I treasure your word in my heart. My heart. Teach me your loving kindness that I may speak and delight in sharing it. I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. I will not forget your word. Oh God, you who hear us, whether we come through Babel technology or straight from the heart or a mind in trouble, you hear us, you hear us clearly. We are so grateful as we remember that we are always in your presence. We invoke you, your spirit, to this moment of prayer and praise. Amen.
Father and mother of us all, as we gather together, surrounded by the loving care of a community of faith, remind us to invite those who are without safety, without support and acceptance into our own sacred space. Challenge us to include those in need, whether here in our own community or on ones on the other side of the globe as part of our own faith community. We continue to lift up those we have named here today, even if we have never met them. May we remember them all, whether they are recovering from disaster, a fleeing refuge, suffering as a victim in many forms of violence, attempting to avoid the daily grind of unemployment, hunger, homelessness, COVID, poverty, struggling with mental illness. God, we cannot help but acknowledge what a generous God you are. Continue to challenge us to reach out to those around us and those that we have never met. Join in this variation upon the Lord's Prayer. Loving Creator, we honor you. And we honor, and honor all of you that you have made. Renew in the whole world in the image, in the image of, of your love. love. Give us what we us need for today. today. And, and a hunger to see the whole world. Strengthen us for us what lies ahead. Heal us from the past. Give us courage to follow your call at this moment. For your love is the only power, the only calm, the only honor we need in this world and in the world to come. Amen. Rock of ages, clear for me. Let me hide my shelter be. Let the water and the blood from your wounded savage flow be of sin the double cure. Plant me from and burn. not the labors of my hands can fulfill your lost demands could my zeal no respite Rock of ages, clap for me. 
God of all abundance, hear our prayers this morning. Guide us as your sons and daughters to respond to the needs of our brothers and sisters wherever they may be. Call upon us in all of our abundance to share what we have so that others may receive what they need to live the abundant life that you have so offered all of us. Dare us to share and to do so faithfully, joyfully, and with conviction. Amen. Praise God who calls us on from here. Praise Christ whose presence calms our fear. Praise Holy morning, I'm going to be using several scriptures throughout the message, one of them being the John passage that's listed in your bulletin. It'll be the last one. So I usually come up first with a theme. And while I was working on this message, I actually have three different themes at the top of my page. I thought I could call it the map. Or maybe it's teaming up with God. Is there a cost in that? Or redefining cost from God's point of view. So those were all the kinds of things that were going through me while I was pulling together my thoughts, ideas, feelings, inspirations, Readings, that's what I do when I bring together a message. I don't do it alone. I have lots of helpers in many forms. So I'm going to begin with something that I received from Martha Spong, who is one of the writers of our inspirational messages that I get daily in, in an email form. And she called it back from the dead. And what she was talking about this week was a passage from Ezekiel. You probably all have no, either know it or you've heard songs sung about it. You know, them bones, them bones, them dry bones. And so she was remembering when she was a child. And this is the part of the quote that I'm going to share with you. God said to me, Prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man. Tell the breath. God, a master says, come from the four winds. Come, breath. Breathe on these slain bodies. Breathe life. So I prophesied. Just as he commanded me. The breath entered them and they came alive. They stood up on their feet, a huge army. And little Martha was quite young listening to this message. She heard the pastor's voice echo through the large church, prophesy to these bones. And as he cried, she could almost feel the whole congregation holding their breath. I heard the power of God in my pastor's voice. Said, to be honest, all those bones, I thought more of Halloween than anything else. I was too young to understand the metaphor. She says, but that voice of my pastor sounded in my head decades later. 
when I was looking for answers in a season of depression and despair. My marriage was crumbling. I had young children to support, no job. Who would put the breath back in my body? I spent some time lamenting on my couch, hoping vaguely that God would make it better as if by magic. Yet the text tells us there's more to it. Restoration is a combined effort. Prophesy to them bones, says God, and the prophet responds. One day I realized I was not alone. God would bring me back from what felt like the grave, says Martha, and I would live. The work begins when we speak to each other and to ourselves. Ends the quote from Martha. See, power and magic are revealed when we partner with God. When we speak to God, who has already begun the conversation, the God who seeks us out in partnership. So that's the first point on the map, the spiritual map that we're going to walk through. There's eight points this morning. That's the first one. God expects to be a team player. He says, listen to my voice, prophet, and then you go tell them. He doesn't say, I'm going to go tell them. He said, you listen to my voice and you go tell them. Map point number one. So now we're going to take a jump and we're going to meet Moses and God working together. This is from the, from the scripture in Numbers. And they set out from Mount Hor. And the Israelites were complaining Moses, why did you bring us out into this desert to die? Why didn't you just leave us there with Pharaoh? Of course, when they were with Pharaoh, they were complaining that they didn't want to be slaves anymore and they wanted to get out. You just couldn't satisfy these folks. So God had it with their complaining and poisonous snakes showed up. And if you got bit, you died. Well, then they came crying to Moses. We're so sorry that we spoke against you and God. Please ask God to get rid of these poisonous snakes. And then God does it again, looking for a team player. Moses comes and says, God, what do I do? And God says, Moses, you craft a copper serpent, you put it on top of a post, and you hold it up. You put it up. And if somebody gets bit by a poisonous snake, if they look upon it, they'll be healed. They won't die. So here we go again. Map point number two, God's still looking for team players. God has something for us to do, something for us to create. Hopefully it's not a snake on the top of a post, but something for us to create. God wants us to make change happen. Scooting along to Samuel, meet Samuel. The boy Samuel was serving God under Eli's direction. Eli was an old man at the time. They lived in the temple. He was a priest, Eli, and a judge. And Samuel was believed to be about 11 years old at the time of this writing of scripture or in this scripture passage. And they had gone to bed one night, each into their own rooms in the temple. And then God called out, Samuel, Samuel. And the youngster says, yes, I'm here. And he ran into Eli's room. He said, I heard you call me. I'm here. Here I am. Eli woke up and he said, Samuel, I didn't call you. Go back to bed. And he did. And as soon as Samuel started falling asleep, he hears, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel got up and he runs into Eli. I heard you call. Here I am. Again, Eli shakes the sleep from his face and he goes, son, I did not call you. Go back to bed. Samuel's going back to sleep and he hears again, 
Samuel, Samuel, a third time he hears Samuel. So he jumps out of bed and he runs to Eli. He goes, yes, yes, I heard you call me. Here I am. And that's when it dawned on Eli that God was calling the boy. So Eli directed Samuel, go back and lie down. If the voice calls again, say, speak, Lord, I'm your servant and I'm ready to listen. Samuel went back to his bed. Then God came and stood before him exactly as before, calling out, Samuel, Samuel. Samuel answered, speak. I'm your servant, ready to listen. So what is God up to here? Samuel's just a boy. God is beginning and nurturing and blessing a relationship that would be Samuel's reason for existence for his whole life. From that night on, Samuel was a powerful and exacting prophet. Everything he spoke to the people was exact and true and on spot. He was known everywhere for being the voice of God. So let's think about this for a moment before we miss the point of the scripture account. Did God show up and call Samuel just to say hi? No, no, God was beginning what was a lifetime relationship. So what was the purpose of this relationship? Were they simply gonna be nighttime chatting buddies? No, of course not. God had a plan and an invitation for Samuel's entire life. Did you notice? Samuel did not go running to God. Did you notice that God came to Samuel asking, take my words, Samuel, take my words to the people. And whether they were friendly words or difficult words, Samuel, be my mouthpiece. So here we are, map point number three. God's like a sports talent scout looking for the best team player out there. Did you notice there's a pattern emerging throughout these sporadic scriptures? And it's repeating, God calls, simply, gently. Samuel is taught to listen and respond. God invites Samuel into a relationship that lasts a lifetime. Next scenario. This one's not a scripture. This one's an actual event. When I pastored a church somewhere else and I'm changing names. Okay. So meet Janet a member of a, another congregation. I served this church several years ago. And after worship, we would meet in the back of the church where there would be a group and we would discuss either the morning's message or a scripture for the day. And that's where I began to discover some important things that helped me help others who said that they wanted a closer relationship with God. I learned when Janet said to me, and I'm quoting, I'm envious of you. You have these rich experiences with God. Why don't I have experiences like yours? And I assured her that every single one of us is capable of the same kinds of experiences. And then I described my journey as it had unfolded. I explained it in a way that I understood it up until that moment. Janet was raw and it had taken a lot of courage to say what she had just said. 
So I gently asked a few questions. And here's the four things I learned from that exchange. Everyone who came to me seeking wisdom as to how to experience the divine, say they want to experience the divine, that they want to be in relationship with God. However, number two, once they know the commitment is to surrender and to trust, to saying yes to the divine, no matter what the perceived cost might be, they panic, they back up, and they decide maybe today it's someone else's turn to say, speak, Lord, your servant is ready and listening. Mm -hmm. And number three that I learned in talking with her that day, those who are envious of another's spirit-filled life, I wondered, is it because they despise their own fear? If I say yes, if I surrender, what will God require of me? Am I afraid of God? What will I have to give up? What am I holding on to so desperately? And number four, do I trust God? Am I up to the task? to partner with God on God's terms, radical trust when everything seems absolutely impossible. Do I have the ability to trust God anyway? Hmm. Those are the four things I learned that day. So what is God's call to you? Have you asked? Have you sought out that answer? Instead of saying, God, this is what I want. And this is how you want me to, I want you to help me. Have you thought that maybe God's been coming to you with a request? Are you listening? <clears throat> or don't you want to know? Will it be a cost more than you're willing to commit to? God's not going to force you. Is that a prayer you have chosen not to pray? Are you all over God because everything in the world is going haywire and you want to know where God is hanging out these days? Has it occurred to you that God is waiting for you and me to answer God's call? That God would like the courtesy of a hearing at least? So map point number four, God's still seeking team players. It's beginning to sound like God won't be satisfied until each of us discovers our place on the team. Next scenario. How is each of us called? to be social justice in the world. Are you getting the idea as we go along this divine map through scripture and personal stories? So let's get closer to home. And I asked permission before I used people's names from our congregation. They've said it's okay. So I don't want you worrying about them while I talk about them. And they're both here. Megan, is gifted at putting together meaningful and deeply thoughtful presentations that stir our hearts and our minds. She responds to the universe's call for justice, God's call for justice. Megan digs deeply into her imagination and creativity as she sculpts the lessons that she shares during the Wednesday evening studies that are currently focused on racism and social justice. Megan offers generous tools to every one of us, guiding us to uncover, to examine our biases from the depths of our beings without blame, yet filled with recognition, discovery, often surprise, sometimes, Moments of deep remorse and palatable sorrow. 
when I realize, and sometimes now when I'm saying I, it's the universal I, all of us, when I realize that yes, I too am part of a deep systemic American problem. I wonder, we wonder, how can that be? I've prayed, I've worked so hard for the causes of social justice that draw me in. Yes, Megan has a gift of holding an illuminated mirror before us and urging us to look in cautiously. I might not like what I see. I might even react with denial until the disturbed water in me settles. And for the first time, I can see clearly. I too am a victim. You too are a victim. We all have been betrayed and hung up to dry. Not the same as what has happened to those who are non-white. Nevertheless, the system is cruel to all of us. We need to keep responding, not reacting. Holding on for the day that will finally come when all of us have freed ourselves from the evils of a system that has raised us up through the years all the while dragging us down, saturating us with the evils of dominance, self-righteousness, what we now label as white supremacy and white privilege. Used to be when I heard those words, my hackles would rise and I would become defensive. That wasn't me. I remember during the first or second month that I was your pastor reading one of the white supremacy books that had been recommended and becoming so upset that I had to stop reading, I felt attacked and I couldn't see the text through my sobbing. Then I did the unspeakable to calm my heart. I did what I never should have done. I called a dear black friend a professional woman whom I respect and admire, a woman whom I love. I shared my pain with her as if I was the oppressed in the scenario. She did what a good friend taken by surprise at wrenching tears would do. She reassured me that I was not one of those people. It's time for me to call her again and apologize for putting her in that position, for asking her to comfort me when I needed to be there for her. I need to confess my naivete and slowness of heart to embrace the reality of white privilege in my life. See, no matter how good in Lily White, see, see right there, did you hear that? Lily White, even the metaphors betray us. So no matter how good in Lily White, one believes he or she is, it is simply impossible to be raised and to live in a system that is America without being tainted by the system. It would be like saying, I'm a fish living and enjoying my everyday existence in the ocean, but I never get wet and I can breathe out of water. You see, it's impossible. Key number five, map number five. God is reaching out to resident prophets. Caution to the winds. God is after all of us, folks. God needs a lot more team players. And so here are some of the important things I've learned. Instead of reacting, choose responding. Megan has the gift and the skill of knowing how to present information that could provoke reactions rather than responses. However, she presents what could be volatile information in a way that allows the hearer to step back 
to receive the concept and thoughtfully make a response rather than a knee-jerk reaction. So let's unpack that just a little further. We're also blessed to have in our congregation, Catherine Whitwright, who like many of you, takes her social justice walk seriously. And Wednesday evening after the deep and profound presentation, there were more people there, and the discussion about white privilege, Catherine concerned for all of us as a church that God is stalking, God is reaching out to us, added, I don't understand why more people aren't here to experience this. These presentations that Megan is providing for us, they should be here. Maybe we need to take these experiences to the larger population. I agree. I agree that there is more that we are called to do and be as the community church in Chesterland. I'm grateful to be a member of a church family that holds each other accountable, including me, to their responsibility to each other and to the community. I know many of you feel this way and take social justice issues to heart. And I'm grateful to be part of this conscious group of Christ followers. Depending on how we first were introduced to social justice matters, it seems to me that we could have had a high danger of knee-jerk reactions to the images of children dying of starvation or thirst or blacks gunned down in our streets by one another and by law officials or watching a crowd standing by observing rather than interfering with blatant street brutality. Years ago, I learned from Dr. Matthew Fox that the role of the prophet, one who speaks with their lives for justice, the prophet's role is the act of interfering. Now that's a lot to process. It takes guts to interfere. To believe that your voice is God's message. You say, I never aspired to being a prophet anyway, so it doesn't matter to me. Let's get real, folks. Sometimes we don't want to get real. We want to stay in our denial and pretend that everything is simply going to go back to normal or everything will just keep on and all is well. Isn't it time we woke up? Every one of us, and that includes me and all of the activists participating this morning and viewing this service during the weeks and months ahead, we must wake up to the fact that if we choose to not have anything to do with our culture and our lives and the way we live our lives in this culture, then someone else will make those decisions for us and we will have to abide by those decisions that we would rather not have to live with. Now that's a mouthful. We're talking politics, but it's bigger than politics. We witness people... <laughs> top of their lungs, MAGA, make America great again, and accompany that cry with violence that results in death. We're talking economics, inequality, unequal pay, discriminating hiring practices, you know it all. We're talking ecology, matricide, we're killing the very planet that supports us. Are we insane or what? The animals are going extinct. We're talking justice system. Every system permeated by patriarchal logic must give way to the divine masculine. The divine masculine and the patriarchy are on opposite ends of the spectrum. And the divine masculine will merge with the divine feminine. And in that sacred message, and that's a sermon for another day, together they create the possibility for balance, nurturance, and growth. One alone is not possible. Have you noticed everything I've shared with you today? God is seeking us, not doing it alone. God is inviting us. 
God wants to be married with us. God wants us to be God in the world. God's voice, God's action. Look at the scriptures. It's everywhere. Map point number six, God still looks for unique team players. God cares about social justice. God loves God's creation. It's really so simple. We don't have a choice. If we don't embrace the role of interference with the way things are, that we don't approve of, that don't match our values, that we, we want to, to pro provide for our children and our grandchildren, then we must decide on an action and take it. Often when we take in this kind of information, our reactions are swift, not thought through, rash. Sometimes we can be hurtful to ourselves or to another. It's difficult information to take in. What more do they want from me? I can't do any more than I'm doing. Ah, those are reactions, not responses. We need to open our hearts. Maybe it's true that you're doing everything you can. Then you do what you do the best you can. One immediate reaction might be, if I didn't even know that this was part of me, how can I be responsible for it? When I take some time to think this through and ask some searching questions about how it could be that I am part of the problem, even when I am truly good intentioned, while thinking that I am part of the solution, we look at our culture, expectations, ways of thinking, being that have surrounded us from childhood and continue to surround us. When we begin to see how the way we think is not the way we might choose to think if we were making a choice. So, so do you get it? We're not making a choice when we're so filled with our culture that we don't know that what we're doing is a choice in the wrong direction. This is tough stuff. This is why we need to be listening to prophets like Megan who are mirroring back to us what we need to see in our own soul. How to loosen our heart and our soul that we can make a choice that we want to make. And not that it just feels right because it's comfortable in the situation in which we were raised. If we only react and don't respond, we're not making free choices. We're making program choices. This place that we call home, that offers me my comforts and my rights, why would I even question what is working so well for me? <laughs> you see, we have to gently turn our focus inward and ask some searching questions. Map point number seven. God wants people who walk in balance. And now to end with today's scripture. The scripture is about a grain of wheat that must die. And Jesus says, listen carefully. Unless a grain of wheat is buried in the ground, dead to the world, it is never any more than a grain of wheat. But if it is buried, it sprouts and reproduces itself many times over. In the same way, anyone who holds on to life just as it is, destroys that life. But if you let it go, reckless in your love, you'll have it forever, real and eternal. 
Do you see what Jesus is saying? You must bury the seed until it cracks open. We all need to crack the shell of the misconception in which we were raised to break free. It's all about interfering, breaking through. If you have to keep breaking your heart until it opens, says Rumi. And Jesus said, now I'm not making this up. Go look at this passage in scripture. Jesus said over 2000 years ago, I'm quoting, at this moment, the world is in crisis. The evil ruler of this world will be thrown out. And I, as I am lifted up from the earth, will attract everyone to me and gather them around me. And he put it this way to show how he's going to be put to death. Our final map point. God is looking for team players. God wants all of us to feel and be an active part in redeeming the world. Oh God, sometimes it's hard to say thank you to you when you shake us up from the inside out. Give us the grace to stay shaken, to get a good look and to respond in a way that redeems ourselves and others in gratitude. Amen. of my soul and I smell the sweet cherry blossoms pouring all the gladness into my soul in winter I believe you in springtime I see you it's so good to be with you my You make all things new Your love is my breakthrough Now I sing hallelujah My hope has come Now I through the valley of the shadow And I have been tested like silver and gold Lord, your faith has taught me to cherish That this light affliction is not my home in winter I believe you in springtime I see you It's so good to be with you My hope has come Lord, you made all things new Your love is my breakthrough Now I sing Frustration, and I'm not gonna give death any standing ovation. 
Between you and me there is no separation in winter I believe you in springtime I see you It's so good to be with you My hope has come Lord you make whole things new Your love is my breakthrough Placing a hand on our heart and a hand to each other, our families, our friends, and the rest of the world. Knowing that the love and the grace and the healing power and the redemptive love of God flows through us as we share with individuals that we think of specifically with groups that we think of and with this world who needs who needs this divine energy and as we send this blessing my prayer is that hardened hearts may be softened that hearts of stone become hearts of flesh that hearts in confusion become hearts in right thinking. And then taking that hand of blessing and grace and power and redemption and bringing it to your own heart, feeling the power of the divine permeating your being, offering you hope, encouragement, and strength as we continue this walk with Jesus. Amen.